All right, so my name is Lisa Sutherland, and I'm a teacher librarian in the Surrey School District. And I was going to get you all to introduce yourselves, but we don't really have a whole lot of time. So, um, so the presentation I was asked to do by the BCTLA uh, was on copyright. And this all started because um, last year I noticed a copyright poster that was over top of my school photocopier. And I thought it was really interesting, but I didn't have time to really take a look at it. So I took a picture of it and sort of put it aside. And then uh, COVID hit and all of a sudden we, we had to pivot. We were looking at websites and videos and worksheets and resources that were going online. And no one really had time uh, in the middle of that to take a look at copyright issues. And as a teacher librarian, I was asked to start um, making videos of myself doing read alouds and posting it to uh, one of the classroom websites. And I didn't feel really comfortable with that um, because I didn't feel that I had enough uh, information on copyright issues to go ahead and, and do that. So uh, I also was working on my um, teacher librarian certificate program through Queens, and I was uh, supposed to be doing an inquiry project. And I thought that was a great opportunity for me to dive into copyright. So I chose that as my project. And when I finished it, it ended up being submitted to the BCTLA as a resource. And that's why they asked me to do this presentation. So I'm just going to quickly go through it. Um, the project, when I started working on it, I realized that it was incredibly complicated and very time consuming to look up everything um, that I wanted to learn that was relevant to the COVID um, situation that we were going through and something that was relevant as a BC teacher or librarian. The project that I worked on, uh, I basically looked at the history of copyright. Um, I looked at how it pertained to classrooms and the learning commons. And then I was looking at some resources that might be useful um, either for myself or to forward to uh, teachers to use. And the resource is posted on the BCTLA website. And I also posted it as a document that you could download as part of your um, registration in this course. So as an overview for the workshop, um, I wanted to reiterate I'm an expert in copyright and I can't give legal advice, but this is just sharing what I learned um, as I went through uh, this project. So I wanted to touch on some areas that, again, relate to the learning commons and the classroom. Uh, I wanted to provide you with some resources that you might find useful um, and uh, talk about some ideas on how to teach copyright. The links that I have on these slides are either in the document, the copyright document, or I also have uh, another one that I created, just a single sheet um, that I can attach at the end for you. So just a quick background on copyright. Um, it is meant to protect the works that are created from being used without permission or payment. So in Canada, under the Copyright Act, it's covered under fair dealings. These are circumstances where you don't have to get permission or uh, have payment involved to use works, but it has to balance the rights of the copyright owners and the users who need to access it for education purposes. So one thing that you should be aware of is access copyright. Um, it's a collective in Canada that represents Canadian copyright holders of written works and Quebec has their own uh, group that does this. So they are responsible for collecting royalties and distributing the fees to the um, copyright holders. This has been going back and forth in the court for a while. Um, I think since, well, in 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada broadened the scope of fair dealing to uh, uh, um, widen who, who could actually um, access works for free or without requiring permission. And schools, school districts have been paying fees to access copyright, uh, whether it's elementary, secondary, public schools, um, private schools, or universities. 
they've been paying access copyright fees to use um, resources and to photocopy. So in 2010, Access Copyright wanted to charge York University $45 per full-time equivalent university student for their copyright tariffs. They lowered it to $26, but at the end of it, York would not pay. And following that, across Canada, colleges and universities started to reject the licensing agreements that Access Copyright was putting forth. In 2012, at the same time, the government added education as a fair dealing purpose, but they didn't clarify what exactly it meant. So York University um, and other universities started working with the idea that 10% of a book, you could photocopy it for free and use it in your classrooms. And so the uh, kindergarten to grade 12 uh, basically followed suit with that. In 2013, Access Copyright filed a lawsuit against York University, calling this illegal photocopying, and they also filed against the um, K-12 and uh, post-secondary sectors. Uh, this went on for a while, and then in 2017, the federal court ruled that York's interpretation of being able to copy 10% of a, of a work was not fair, and that they could not opt out of paying licensing fees. In 2018, Ontario school boards and education ministries across Canada, except for BC and Quebec, filed lawsuit against access copyright for overpayment of their fees. Um, in 2018, the Council of Ministers of Education Canada released a policy statement on fair dealing for schools, and we'll take a look at that website a little later. In 2020, an appellate court ruled that schools and universities are not required to pay tariffs, and the Supreme Court agreed to hear uh, an appeal case uh, for access copyright versus York University. So this year, the court case went through, and the Supreme Court ruled that schools and universities are not required to pay tariffs to access copyright, but they did not rule on York's interpretation of being able to photocopy 10% of works. So my understanding is that now BC no longer pays fees either to access copyright. So that was just a quick nutshell of uh, the history. And if you go to the Publishing Perspectives website, they have a lot of articles on there that are actually quite interesting on the issue of uh, copyright and education in Canada. Let me just see if I can go to that. All right, can you see this page? Yes, we do. Perfect. So in on your own time, if you're interested in going to this website, I recommend taking a look at it because um, the articles are, are pretty uh, brief and they're easy to read. So um, if you're interested in learning more about it, that's a good spot to go to. Okay. Um, Okay, and then there's also another article here. I won't click on it, but I'll give you the link for it. So this is just another explanation of um, the court case that we just had uh, where the Supreme Court said that tariffs are not mandatory. So I'm just gonna take a quick break here, quick pause. Do you have any questions so far about what I've been going over? No, okay. So, potential copyright issues at school. So this is directly out of my, um, my document that I did, my project. Um, so this just quickly talks about some things to think about as a teacher librarian. Um, for teachers and teacher librarians, you have to think about when you're photocopying materials, whether it's a book, a textbook, workbooks, sheet music, and handing it out to students. If you're uh, taking work from teachers, pay teachers, uh, and distributing it to colleagues without purchasing additional licenses. Uh, if you're using personal CDs or DVDs in the classroom or the library, if you're streaming using Netflix, YouTube, or iTunes. Um, if you're posting copyright material to, to the school website or to classroom websites. 
if you're posting students work to a website without their permission or without their guardian's permission. Um, and I thought this was interesting if you're using your work computer to create uh, intellectual property or storing it on the district cloud service. So, for example, if you're creating a, an exam or something, if you're creating anything and you want to, say, use it uh, to sell it on teacher pay, teachers pay teachers or something like that, um, the district may actually own the copyright of that work that you've created. Um, oops. If you're using photos of uh, from books of books or other media jackets, um, those might be considered copyright as well. And for students in the classroom, um, if they're using copyrighted photographs or information from books and textbooks and not using the right citations for it, if they're downloading music for assignments, if they're creating digital content online using other copyrighted materials, those are all things that. Um, are worth looking into just to make sure that there are no copyright violations there. And for the school itself, I thought it was interesting. Um, if, you, if schools are using music for assemblies over the PA system for dances or events, events where admittance fees are charged, then there may be a copyright issue. Um, I don't know uh, how it works throughout the province, but SOCAN uh, collects fees for schools to be able to use music at school. So I don't know what all the the regulations are for that and if it's a blanket across BC or if it's specific to school districts, but that's something to be aware of. Um, okay. So we talked about students own copyright of their work. Uh, so you do need their permission if you're going to post it. Um, I uh, came across this in one of my um, research articles. Websites created and operated by teachers for students are not considered educational institutions. They're not authorized by the school. The Copyright Act users' rights for schools do not apply. So that's something to keep in mind as well if you have your own website that you use um, for teaching. And another big one that I've come across is Netflix. So Netflix does not have a subscription for schools. And their contract states that the account is for personal use only. So if you wanted to throw a movie on in the library or the classroom uh, through Netflix, you're actually violating copyright. You can't do that. So uh, another thing that I looked at is what happens if you violate copyright? So I just, in my uh, project, I just listed a, a few uh, examples of lawsuits. Um, one in particular, Houston School District uh, staff were photocopying and posting materials online. The jury awarded the publisher $9.2 million. So there's a lot of money uh, at stake there. And if you, uh, as an employee, violate copyright, the school district can be held responsible for that. And uh, to give you an example, um, I was told when I went to a, a, a training session at my district that uh, there was a pack that held a movie night fundraiser and they played a movie and one of the parents in attendance had actually worked on the movie. So he went and talked to his employer and the employer came back to the district and they had a discussion about how, you know, the school was airing a movie that uh, they hadn't basically paid, paid a fee for. So schools uh, are not supposed to be showing movies that haven't been, uh, they haven't had the royalties paid. So that's an issue that uh, PACs need to be aware of because I've been on PACs for years and I know movie nights, movie nights do happen as a popular fundraiser. Okay, so potential copyright issues at school. Um, so with COVID hitting, we basically were doing a lot of things uh, posting things online for, for our students. Um, as teacher librarians, we may have been doing live read-alouds online in Teams or on Zoom or recording a read-aloud and posting it. Um, so during the pandemic, some of the publishing companies temporarily allowed open access so that teachers or teacher librarians could use books uh, for their read-alouds online. But there were stipulations um, as far as acknowledging the publisher, the author, 
things like that. And then there was a set end date that you had to take if you put a video online that you had to take it down. There was some confusion over whether or not um, this applied to Canada, if it was an American published uh, book. And during the pandemic, Access Copyright created a read aloud program. So if you paid a fee, if your district paid a fee, then you could read all or part of in, uh, select in print books from their list and post the video recording online temporarily. So the Council of Ministers of Education, I'm just gonna go to their website. So this is a great tool. They have all sorts of information, question and answers about COVID, uh, what, you, what you can and can't do. Um, and so I have the link uh, in the document for you. So it just answers all kinds of questions um, about fair dealings. And uh, so here it says, is Access Copyrights Read Aloud Canadian Books program available to teachers in elementary and secondary schools? No, with the exception of elementary and secondary schools in British Columbia. So that was because of the ongoing court cases and with the other provinces not paying the fee to access copyright. So that's what they have on there. But if you go right now to Access Copyrights website, it says that um, their, re their read aloud program is not available to public schools in BC, basically. It says it's only available to K-12 independent schools that have a license. And it says all of the public schools in across Canada have stopped paying fees. So to the best of my knowledge, based on this, um, as a teacher librarian, I cannot uh, post uh, read aloud videos online um, unless I go specifically to the publisher and see what they have on there. So I put an example here, Peng Penguin Random House Canada. So if you scroll down, they they have some information about what you can and can't do. So they have extended their license to March 31st, 2022. And it tells you what you, what you can read um, and if you're gonna post it when you have to take it down. So you can check through that if you're interested. Take a quick break here. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to fly through this. I was uh, having difficulty getting logged on here. I didn't have time to get set up and I know I have to be off in about five, I think five minutes. So no questions. Okay, so this is from my, um, my uh, project. So I talked about why educators should uh, be interested in learning basics of copyright and obviously because they handle copyright materials during their teaching. They need to be able to teach students information literacy and ethical behavior as part of curriculum. And they might not access certain teaching materials because they're afraid of violating copyright laws when actually they can use it because of uh, fair dealings. Um, students, one of the main reasons why students really should be learning about copyright, I think, is because of. Um, technology and they are they are more and more becoming their own content creators posting things on on websites on social media and they should understand the concepts of ownership and copyright and what they what they can use and what they can't uh, for teacher librarians um, we are considered the guardians of content we should know um, we should be comfortable with using copyright books and resources and knowing uh, how they can be used. And um, we also play a big role in teaching students information and digital literacy, um, teaching them ethical behavior in inf using information, plagiarism, privacy, copyright, respect and responsibility, and teaching them how to access, evaluate, use and share information effectively and ethically honoring intellectual property property. Okay. 
Now, the Council of Ministers of Education Canada, their website, they have a resource called Copyright Matters. It's a PDF document. It's worth um, taking a look at it. So there's a link there um, that I'll give you that you can, you can use. Um, they also have the Fair, Dis Fair Dealing Decision Tool, which we uh, actually click on that. Oh, it's not going to work. Okay. Um, so their Fair Dealing Decision Tool, what that is, is it um, basically tells you whether or not you can use a particular item in your teaching if it falls under the category of fair dealings. These are three books that I used for my um, project that I thought were really, really useful. So I would recommend if you are interested in learning more about copyright, these three books, and I have listed them in my document for you as well. So the first one, it's a, it's a very thin, it's a thin book. It's not, it's not a heavy read. Um, and it pertains specifically to copyright in school libraries. The other two books are a little bit meatier and uh, they delve into copyright law. But again, they are, I found them really interesting. So if you want to learn more, I recommend those books. So jumping into teaching copyright, you can host some workshops for staff. You could create some infographics with some basics on it and hand it out to staff or to students. You could create some posters, work on some collaborative activities with teachers, and you could refer to copyright when you're doing read alouds, when you're using textbooks, showing videos, handing out photocopies, just to increase the awareness with students that there is copyright and when, when it uh, applies. Now, because we didn't have a chance to talk about if you're coming from secondary or elementary school, um, the resources that I posted on here, I think most of them probably would pertain more to elementary school, but you can take a look at them. They are um, hyperlinked in my documents, so you can access those. This is one area that I thought was really interesting when I was doing my research. I came across in, in one of those books that I recommended to you, they talked about Indigenous education, and it was something that I hadn't really thought of before in terms of copyright, but it mentioned that Indigenous storytelling and traditional medicine don't fall into the specific category of copyright and traditional knowledge predates Canadian copyright. It has no single author. Ownership is based on custodianship, community and responsibility. And it talks about how the reproduction or alteration of works might damage the honor of a clan, culture or nation and that Indigenous works that are not made by Indigenous peoples or with their permission, uh, that's something that you should be aware of. For example, if you're shopping down in Gastown or somewhere and you see, you know, the totem poles or t-shirts that are made up with uh, Indigenous artwork on it, is it, was it really made by an Indigenous person? Um, is it representing them authentically? And then for picture books, that's also something else important uh, or even other books uh, in libraries. Uh, if they're based on First Nations storytelling, but they're not written by First Nations people, do we consider them to be authentic resources? So if you haven't been there before, there's a website called Strong Nations, and it's a publishing uh, uh, organization in Nanaimo. And they have a, a list of all the, all the books on, that they have on there um, have been authenticated as uh, Indigenous resources. So. It's just something that I thought was really interesting and it would probably make for a really good um, teachable uh, activity with students thinking about that. Another way to teach copyright would be just to look at headlines and we don't have time to go through all of this, but I have the links ready for you. And um, there's things like Ogopogo. They've, uh, the city of Vernon has passed over the copyright of Ogopogo to the uh, First Nations people. Um, there's articles online about the York court case um, in Australia. I saw there's a story about the orig Aboriginal flag dispute, who owns the right to use it. So these are all things that you could use um, as topics for teaching. 
there's another article, the Quebec book industry calls for reform of the Copyright Act, and they explain why they think it needs to be changed. So that might be a good topic to look at. And then um, I don't know a lot about it, but there's an issue with Instagram and, and copyright uh, photos that are being used um, and, and reposted. Does that violate copyright? So that might be a good one for students to investigate. Um, another thing you could do is have students post their work to Creative Commons so that they have an understanding, uh, hands-on of what it means to create something and then to um, how, how are they going to assign uh, permission to use that. You could have classroom debates on a certain aspect of copyright, have them investigate some of the resource links that um, are in this presentation, have them investigate how to request permission to use copyright materials. And uh, this is where I was going to stop and we were going to have a little chat about have you taught anything about copyright? Do you have any ideas to share? Um, I don't think we're going to have time for that. Yeah, I'm supposed to be out at 11.05. So we'll just have to pass that. So my last slide was talking about our conference theme, leadership during and after COVID. And I felt that copyright actually was a really good uh, topic that applies to this. Um, just because, like I said, we were basically trying to scramble and figure out how to teach online and no one really had time to think about whether or not copyright was uh, was being uh, followed or not. And I think that it's something that we will continue after COVID as well, because I think a lot of what we do may um, still be kept on, certain parts of it will still be kept online. So mainly, uh, remember, it's not our job to be copyright police, but it's important that we know uh, what, what falls under copyright uh, regulations um, because we work with these materials and we teach students. Um, and then I was going to talk about what will your role be as a teacher librarian to lead discussions and teachings on copyright? Are you familiar with how these fit into the BC curriculum? And what would you want to focus on just to start with to increase copyright awareness at your school? So I managed to cram this all in in a short amount of time. I apologize, this was so rushed, but if you do have any questions for me, um, you can ask me right now or uh, you can get a hold of me. I'll just go back to my first. There we go. So that's my email if you wanna get a hold of me. So thank you so much for spending time listening to me ramble on about this topic and uh, I hope the rest of the day goes a lot smoother because it was a crazy start and I'm totally flustered. <laughs> Thanks so much Lisa that was quite fascinating there's it's such a huge topic like it, it really is. It is it really is and I like said I'm just I, I went through on Zoom and I had this all set up on the weekend. I was able to get my camera working. It was all good. And then today the bleep hit the fan. And it's just been, it's been uh, an exciting day. <laughs> yes. But I do appreciate you hanging in there with me and, you know, letting me go through this. I actually haven't had to do a workshop before, so it's just been a lot today <laughs> to go through. Your next one should be super easy. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, I was scrambling trying to get a hold of the help desk to figure out how to log on as a presenter because my link wasn't working and it was just, yeah. Everybody needs a good stiff drink of their choice tonight. Yes. But thank you so much for... Uh, I, I have a quick question uh, for yes. Netflix. Uh, we were told we can show documentaries. Is that right? Pardon Not me? Movies. For Netflix... Yes. We are allowed to show our students the no. documentaries. No, you cannot show. Um, you cannot show Netflix. No, I'm not at all. Not at all, because it's it's only licensed when you when you pay at when you subscribe to Netflix. It's as an individual. You are not allowed to show it to a group of people. You are not allowed to use it in a school setting, and they don't have a license or a subscription for schools right now. All right. So I know there was a lot of confusion about it. Um, 
when I was in doing my certificate program, they, um, one person said that, yes, the Langley School District said you can use Netflix. They called, they talked to Netflix on the phone. You can, but in reality, you, you can't. You can't use a verbal um, permission to, to use something. It has to be in writing, and Netflix will not put it in writing, and they do not have a subscription. All right. Good deal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks. You too.